It's another set of space updates, my friends, and of course, stealing the limelight on all fronts was SpaceX. It may have been something to do with the lead up to Starship's orbital flight test with Booster 9 and Ship 25, do you think? Anyway, it was all set to go on the 17th, and now a brand new setback. Yes, there is a very good reason why this video has been released a little earlier this week. This didn't stop them launching a plethora of Falcon 9 rockets in the meantime. Lots to jump into there, plus a bunch of other updates from the wider landscape that is commercial space. Hold on tight, the next few days are going to be wild. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. This week we were all poised in anticipation for SpaceX's Starship Orbital Flight Test 2. The lead up to this event has been a breakneck roller coaster of a ride. Here we were barreling towards the launch day after the largest rocket ever created all but destroyed its pad back in April. That's right, only around seven months ago, which was a messy but absolutely amazing spectacle. As just a bit of a side note to the footage you are seeing right now, this was released by SpaceX on YouTube as well as X. Yes, you heard that right. For the first time since June, SpaceX published two videos on YouTube. One about Falcon 1, which seemed a little random, but then this new Starship compilation as they prepared for that upcoming second flight test. Was this a good sign that indeed the test would be streamed on YouTube once again? They may have been using it to just promote the event rather than stream it, but soon find out I guess. Now let's just rewind here real quick. Imagine working at Starbase as one of the talented team members being involved in one of the most extraordinary space missions of the year, every day pushing new boundaries on these innovative vehicles, creating solutions to problems such as the water-cooled steel plate system for this launch, making a new hot staging system which they have never done before. This booster is looking incredibly refined now as they continue with iteration after iteration. It has gone through this epic static fire months ago, the design of the Raptor 2 engines there being readied for installation before it actually flies. For me, it has been a true inspiration watching how fast they've managed to make all of these updates so quickly. Then you've got the upper Starship stage equally as exciting with mind-blowing static fire events of its own. Only the six engines on this beauty with nine being intended for future iterations and just look at it go. Add to that the intricate tower smoothing out the process of stacking and of course finally the full wet dress rehearsal to ensure that it is indeed ready for flight. The reason that we are so passionate about this rocket concept comes down to a number of things. Firstly, it's the largest and the most powerful rocket to ever take flight. That's a fun thing alone, right? It's also designed to be fully and rapidly reusable. Although they've nailed that with the first booster stage of the trusted Falcon 9 along with its fairings, not the second stage. If SpaceX can indeed nail this design and reuse it as intended, not only will it reduce the cost of mass to orbit a great deal, it will also be able to put payloads into orbit much more massive than ever before. Now, last week you may recall I mentioned that Ship 25 may be destacked unexpectedly once more due to a tile going missing. Well, that ended up being true and more. Down it came last weekend, and it turns out they wanted to do more than just fix a few missing tiles because the hot staging ring stand had rolled down to the launch site again too. Before we knew it, off went Booster 9's hot staging cap as we've seen numerous times now. So here it actually sat for a few days as we awaited news on the final launch approval. The new tiles were placed on, initially held in place with the tape, and then the next day the tape was removed. Elon posted early in the week that he was informed that approvals should happen in time for the Friday launch, so we just needed to patiently wait for that to be the case. Everything was still looking great for that Friday. Road closures were published for the 17th, 18th and 19th, all running from 12am to 2pm. Notice to Mariners from the 17th to the 20th as well. Likewise, matching dates for the Marine Safety Information Bulletin. The FAA advisory was updated to show Starship Flight 2 on the 17th, then the notice to air missions or NOTAM was in place to match. That by the way is the FAA definition of NOTAM for those telling me last week that I was wrong. Notice to airmen is the old lingo from before December of 2021. Anyway, another great sign was the release of the matching temporary flight restrictions for the 17th. Amazing, right? 
and the weather. That looked great also. It really did look like things were lining up as we had hoped, and just like that, on Wednesday, we had the conclusion of the US Fish and Wildlife investigation. Yes, this major piece still missing has now been finished, and then moments later, the FAA approval was also through. At this point, it was all down to SpaceX, and they will go for a Friday launch attempt at 7am local time. So let's quickly look at some of the more interesting details from the Fish and Wildlife report. First, we'll start off with the plate of the Deluge system. In this section here, they say that for each Starship launch up to, and please do keep in mind the up to here, 190 pounds of metal could be ablated from the plate. That doesn't seem too much of a concern, and if that holds up to that standard, it could last for hundreds of launches before a major repair. Let's just see the result after this test flight though, shall we? We also got some more information on the technicals of the water tank farm used for the system. They state that during one deluge test, around 358,000 gallons of water, or over 1.3 million litres, will be released. Added to that, the nitrogen system behind it will release at 3,000 psi, or 205 bar. That is absolutely crazy to think about, and that high pressure system is indeed needed for such a large amount of water. All up, the Fish and Wildlife Service found that the amount of water that is expected to escape at the vertical launch area is likely to be less than the amount of water released on this area from an average rainfall event. So they conclude that the salinity levels of the wetlands, or any concern about wildlife nesting nearby, are not predicted to be a cause of concern. That is great news, because I know the effect of the deluge system on the wetlands has been a debate in a couple of places, so it's nice to see the actual information from the real experts finally. The document did also highlight that SpaceX are still planning on a second orbital launch pad, but they do note that this won't impact on the maximum of 10 launches expected per year. So what this seems to indicate is that Starbase will remain a research and development site, with Cape Canaveral looking to become the more active launch pad. While on that topic, a second tower at Starbase is quite interesting actually, because we were all stunned when this metal piece rolled up to the main gates at Starbase. Randolph Visuals caught a great photo of it here at the launch pad before the driver realised that they had gone the wrong way and then sped back as they entered the build site. Yes, this is actually what you think it is. It's a metal pillar section of a Starship tower. More specifically, this part has supports for the overhang for the top section of the tower there. This top section has never been spotted in the collection of spare tower segments at the Roberts Road facility at the Cape. Could they perhaps be planning to build the eighth section here, and then ship all those other sections from Roberts Road to form a complete second tower at Starbase? That, my friends, is very speculative, but let me know what you think. So, as if the legal and the weather side of things wasn't great enough, after a few more days performing some checks and a little work on the vehicles, the launch site crane lifted that hot staging ring back up. Of course, before we knew it, Ship 25 was heading back up too, to be stacked for the sixth time. The ship soon performed some flap tests, and the booster grid fins wiggled a bit too. This one looked a little odd though. Oh no! Of course, soon after, here was Elon confirming that they had a fault with one of those grid fin actuators, which would require it to be split back apart. The launch was in fact not on the 17th at all, and instead pushed back another 24 hours, although I'll not be surprised if it needs to push just a little further if they can't fix it up in time. SpaceX did not mess around after this was found, because the ship was rapidly destacked, followed by the hot staging ring, so that they could get in there and find that problematic actuator. Saying that, it looks like they've already upgraded three of those just in case. Just earlier, here they were all rolling away beautifully. So yes, this week has been a bit of an emotional minefield, I will say, but thank you, thank you so much for being fans of this game-changing story. From a personal level though, for loving how we present that and so many other topics in these weekly videos, you can't imagine how much this has changed all of our worlds. There is just so much to cover and talk about together, and you being subscribed here is just something that I'll always be so grateful for. You've given not only myself and the team this bizarre opportunity, but also the amazing individuals creating incredible 3D models and and animations. Not only is this shirt designed by Tony Bella amazing, available for just a little while longer, but he got together with a bunch of the artists and they released their wonderful Artists of Spaceflight 2024 Starship calendar. Just check this out. You talented Starship nerds blow my mind every freaking week. The link for that is below if you want to check it out in more detail. 
Now there has been no new Starlink launches since our last video, but one coming shortly. But as the network grows, Starship's ability to increase bandwidth even more rapidly becomes crucial, not just for SpaceX, but for so many services and regions around the world relying on what has quickly become a groundbreaking advancement. Starship will increase that even more, which I'll jump into in a second, but it's incredible to me just how much Starlink has changed the world already. Look through any comment thread out there though, and you will see that it is now a pretty big source for controversy. You've probably seen this story on Starlink, right? Versions of this are everywhere, and it's hard to make sense of all of this information, especially when news coverage is just so divided. This exact problem inspired former NASA engineer Harleen Kaur to build Ground News, an app and website that gives you a better way to compare and share multiple perspectives on a story. On Ground News, I can see that there are more than 100 articles published on this Starlink story alone in the last week, and it's getting a lot more attention from right-leaning organizations. Looking through the headlines, I noticed some distinct narratives. Some outlets focus on the fact that service will only be provided to recognized aid organizations, while others suggested that Israel is outraged by Musk's plan. It's also really interesting to see the division of ownership, knowing that 13% of all the coverage is coming from government-funded news outlets, who may have a vested interest in whether Gaza gets connectivity or not. I've been leaning on ground news quite a bit in my research lately, because I want to make sure that I'm giving you a a balanced view. It's especially valuable at a time when we're really trying to make sense of complex geopolitical issues, and right now you can take advantage of their biggest sale of the year to get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to do my analysis. It works out to be just $5 a month, and I encourage you to check it out. Thank you, Ground News. So what do you think? Would sending communication equipment to help internationally recognized aid organizations be a positive or a negative thing? I'm interested in your thoughts on that, so let me know. There's over 5,000 of those satellites in orbit now, made up of earlier version one satellites and the more recent version two minis. They have been a nice upgrade, but the full-sized Starlink version 2s that can fly on Starship only due to them being around 7 meters long are something else entirely. They are estimated to provide close to an order of magnitude more capability than the original version 1s. An always marvelous dedicated small satellite rideshare mission was back again, and this one spectacular in its own unique way. Here, SpaceX were back at Vandenberg Space Force Base with 113 satellites packed between those fairings. In this mission, we were lucky to see what seems these days like a rare daylight launch with liftoff just before 2 p.m. This was the ninth transporter mission, which always breathes some well-needed excitement into the small satellite industry, sometimes a little criticism as well, given how much SpaceX are now taking over the small satellite market. In many cases, it is just cheaper than going with a small rocket. Although Although small launch vehicles such as Rocket Lab's Electron can still provide specific orbits, it is very hard now to beat SpaceX simply on price and, more importantly, reliability. So there we have stage separation and an absolutely breathtaking shot there on the right of the booster flipping. You can even see it starting up the boost back burn and the shortened Merlin vacuum nozzle there. Due to the payload mass, SpaceX don't need as much performance as they do on, say, a Starlink mission, so they get away with this cheaper but less efficient engine bell. The great thing about transporter emissions is that they head all the way back to the launch site, and on this occasion, the daylight launch made for an absolutely spectacular landing. We've got this sped up for you, of course, but after passing the roughly 15 second entry burn, just watch how clear that footage was right down onto landing zone four. Bam, that is another one, my friends. Fly and landing number 12 for this booster, number 1071, and the 244th landing ever of a booster. We are only a few flights away now from the big 250 mark. Wow. So afterward, of course, the absolutely beautiful and rapid deployments. Many of those smaller satellites being ejected from their parent launch containers and heading off onto their individual missions. They include, by the way, many missions for student groups and universities all over the world. Imagine the learning opportunities and the experiments that they can all collectively run now on these instruments, all at a cost that is affordable enough to actually allow them to get them here in the first place. It's all inspiring the next generation of inventors, and all this is made possible by Falcon 9. You can just imagine when Starship is flying all the time. These payloads could be deployed for next to nothing, just as side tasks for the actual missions. I find that incredibly exciting. 
SpaceX also launched a crucial pair of O3B M-Power satellites, marking a significant step towards their commercial deployment. Now SES, the Luxembourg-based network provider, can start providing their services with six of their O3B M-Power satellites in orbit. This mission screamed off the pad from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, heading to a medium Earth orbit on this ninth mission for this booster. The Boeing-built satellites separated from the rocket approximately two hours later, with successful post-launch contact confirmed by SES. Interestingly, they recently had four of the existing satellites in the network face a major electrical issue, one that appears to have reduced their operational life and overall effectiveness. Now, These newer satellites are designed to have a tenfold increase in throughput compared to the first generation, and were supposed to have an operational life of about 10 years. Sadly, this glitch may not let these satellites reach that goal. The fifth and the sixth satellites, which were the ones launched in this mission, were identical to those already in orbit, but Boeing, who is now manufacturing them, is now going to upgrade the remaining five satellites that they've agreed to build to fix that issue. Along with that, they're going to deliver another two satellites to help cover this lost productivity. All up, this is going to delay their launches by about a year, apparently. Anyway, that was another successful mission finalized by the token landing shot of Booster 1076, touching down here on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. So it has just recently been announced that SpaceX will launch the X-37B space plane on a Falcon Heavy in just a few weeks. This is interesting because they've never launched on a Falcon Heavy before. I think we can then assume that the seventh mission, named OTV-7, is obviously going to push some new boundaries with this vehicle. These missions are few and far between, with the first four missions flying on the Atlas V. That goes all the way back to 2010. The OTV-5 mission from 2017 flew on Falcon 9, once only for SpaceX, and then back to Atlas V for Mission 6. So yes, only the second mission with SpaceX, and obviously the first with the triple cord 27 engine beast that is the Falcon Heavy. It's always wonderful to witness one of those flights. To date, Falcon Heavy has never recovered a center booster, and it looks like this mission will be no exception. Both the side boosters will land at landing zones 1 and 2, and the center core will again, by the looks of it, be expended. So this is kind of a strange looking space plane, this one, isn't it? And really, no one outside those with the clearance knows what it is doing up there for so long. The previous mission was in orbit somewhere for over 900 days. It looks a little dated now, that design, doesn't it? But in contrast, Sierra Space and the Dream Chaser look super modern. They were preparing tenacity here for its journey to NASA's Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio. This vehicle, I think, is just one that you can't help but be excited about. A return of this space plane design, but this time a commercial one. Apart from the X-37B and the Shenlong space plane, no other orbital space plane design has flown since the shuttle. You can just imagine how this inspirational team is feeling as they approach the first ever flight of this little beauty. You may also recall me mentioning recently that Sierra Space were preparing for their biggest ever burst test of the inflatable space station module technology. In fact, they released this image here just the other day, showing the huge size of it. Failure is not just a possibility, it is a requirement of this test, and I sure can't wait to see it. Dream Chaser, of course, is initially just for cargo, but eventually, assuming the success of all parts of the design, a crew version is planned. Now, one interesting point of confusion by people is that there has already been a space mission with the Dream Chaser. This footage here is what you quite often see, but actually, these early tests were low-altitude drop tests such as this one in 2017. Indeed, a trip to space will certainly be a first. The small reusable vehicles are certainly adding some new life into the industry, I will say. Recently, Ariane Space were showing off this new potential trick up their sleeve. This concept is SUSY, or the Smart Upper Stage for Innovative Exploration. It's kind of an intriguing looking mashup of what a space shuttle and a starship would look like. As you can probably tell, this is a reusable upper stage design for the Ariane 6 rocket, whenever that may fly. The idea is that this could take cargo and crew to space, and then land right back at home to be used again. Geez, it sure would be a tight fit for the crew in there though, wouldn't it? Well, of course, this is a small prototype, but it's pretty neat looking, isn't it? It's actually a reduced scale demonstrator, as they described it, and in these tests, they are simply trying out some of the control mechanisms in their development plan to swiftly master the key technologies of the concept. 
kind of a neat spectacle as we await action with the vehicle that it should actually fly on. Ariane 6 was supposed to be ready by 2020, but three years later we still haven't seen it on the launch pad yet. The latest thought is that it may fly sometime in the middle of 2024. So that was quite an epic week, wasn't it? I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe or check that you are still subscribed. Thanks to my team for the huge work to get all this out in time. And of course, I couldn't pay them without all you super, super wonderful fans. Thanks for helping us out. You are amazing, each and every one of you. If you want to continue with more space goodness, the algorithm thinks that you will enjoy this video here next, or maybe these videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.